Hello everybody and welcome back to another exciting edition of Biographic, the show in which I, Matt the Game Boy, take you through the highs and lows of the Game Boy Library, one cart at a time. This week, let's begin at the beginning with Yakuman. To most people, Friday the 21st of April 1989 was just another day. The radio blared songs like Madonna's Like a Prayer, cinema goers gasped at the original Pet Cemetery, and young, impressionable gamers threw games like The Adventures of Lolo and The Guardian Legend into their Nintendo Entertainment Systems. Little did they know that in Japan, a new handheld system was being released that would become a cultural icon in the decades to follow, selling 118 million units across its hardware iterations as the world fell in love with portable power. But on that day in 1989, the Nintendo Game Boy launched in Japan very modestly. Priced at 12,500 yen, it came in a stunningly minimalist silver box with four AA batteries, a pair of headphones, and the promise of being a handy game machine. Alongside it on the shelf were four launch titles, Super Mario Land, Baseball, Alleyways, and a fourth game that would never make its way to either America or Europe, called Yakuman. Now, Nintendo, as most people know, originally started out by making traditional Japanese Hanafuda playing cards, before beginning to make toys in the early 1960s, a decision that eventually led them to making video games. This was all partially thanks to the father of the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi, who started working at the company on the Hanafuda production line before his Ultra Hand toy became a huge success for the company, and they pivoted to become the Nintendo we know and love today. Following this lineage of card maker to toy maker and eventually video game powerhouse, it's not too surprising to learn that Nintendo also produced Japanese mahjong sets under the brand name Yakuman. The name comes from a mahjong term for a hand so difficult to attain, it almost always automatically wins around. As the company grew, Nintendo kept making these Yakuman sets, and eventually as Yokoi's Game & Watch games took the world by storm, the company even made a computer mahjong Yakuman. This deluxe LCD device was even the first Nintendo system capable of being linked together for two-player gaming. Yes folks, without a Tetris for its Japanese launch, one of Nintendo's killer apps for capturing the hearts and minds of Japanese salarymen was Mahjong. And why not? The Famicom was already full of Mahjong titles by 1989, from Nintendo's own R&D 1 developed Mahjong, to Capcom's controller-supported Jisen Mahjong games, not to mention the whole host of saucy bootleg carts flooding the market. Now, like most Western gamers, my only exposure to Japanese Mahjong has been through the Yakuza games, as this isn't the tile matching game many people think of when they hear the word Mahjong, but more like a classic card game similar to Rummy. I have to be honest though, even in the Yakuza games, it was never something I really invested much time in. So, I spent most of my week playing various titles, and despite its very complicated rule set, I actually found myself getting quite into Mahjong. As Mahjong games go, Nintendo's Yakuman, developed by Intelligent Systems, is, for all intensive purposes, a very bare-bones game. Like baseball, Intelligent Systems chose to ape the design of Nintendo's Famicom offering, though they did add a little more versatility in the options available to the player. Like the Famicom game, Yakuman is an arcade style Mahjong game, i.e. one versus one, rather than the four player and more traditional Mahjong you might have seen in the Yakuza series. Naturally, this suits the Game Boy's limited screen size perfectly, as I can tell that intelligent systems were having trouble rendering the Mahjong tiles themselves on the Game Boy as is, let alone having to do so about half the scale. Just like the computer Mahjong Yakuman, this arcade style of Mahjong perfectly suits itself to some two-player action via the link cable. This, of course, can be selected at the title screen, and will undoubtedly bring hours of joy if you have someone else in your life that cares about retro games and Japanese Mahjong. For the rest of us, clicking that one-player option brings you into a menu screen with various rule options. If you know anything about Mahjong, here's how they translate to English, but for those unfamiliar with the game, Trust me when I say you want to leave them as is. The next screen offers five possible computer opponents to play against, from Sirius Taro at the top to Yakuman Master at the bottom. The names are all Japanese puns meant to invoke the opponent's difficulty and style of play, but for most of us, 
I think it's enough to say the first option is the easiest, and the difficulty then progresses the further down you go. This is a notable addition from Nintendo's Famicom Mahjong game, which simply offered the player three levels of difficulty. It means there's more versatility in the Mahjong on offer here, and that you can turn off house rules to your preference. I will say though, if you're just starting out at Mahjong like I am, well, even the easiest option is going to be relatively tough. While I'm not going to go too in-depth with how to play Mahjong, because honestly, I'm simply not knowledgeable enough to be able to do it, I will tell you the basics. The goal for each player is to make their 14 tiles into a winning hand. Like playing cards, Japanese Mahjong tiles have three suits, bamboo, dots and characters, and follow the number sequence 1 to 9. The first two suits are pretty obvious to tell apart, sticks for bamboos and circles for dots. The character tiles though are a little bit more tricky to remember, as their 1 to 9 is displayed in Japanese kanji. Yep, there's a bit of a learning curve here folks. To make things even more complicated, there's also honor tiles, which are a little bit like kings, queens and jacks, but don't belong to any particular suit. There's three dragons and four winds. Fortunately, you only need to match these tiles together, so you're not going to have to remember any kanji. Just remember three suits of tiles from 1 to 9, and then seven unique other tiles. There's four of each of these tiles in the game, making a total of 136 tiles. So. Those are the tiles, but how you use them. Well, at the beginning of a round, each player is dealt 14 tiles and then must try to make a winning hand. The most common of which is three melds and a pair. A meld is basically either three of the same tile, called a pung, i.e. three of the one of bamboos, or three white dragon tiles. You can also, if you're very lucky, create a meld with four of the same tile, which is called a can, but it doesn't happen too often. There's also another, more common meld made from a sequence of three tiles called a chow. For example, the 1, 2, 3 of dots, or 4, 5, 6 of bamboo. The important thing to remember is they need to be of the same suit. It's also worth bearing in mind this doesn't work with the honor tiles, so sorry, one of each dragon or north, east, south doesn't count. And of course, a pair is two of the same. To make this winning hand though, at the start of your turn you draw a tile and then discard one. By doing this, you start weeding out the tiles you can't use in your hand. Be careful though, as each tile you discard can be stolen by your opponent to make melds of their own, but fortunately, you can also do the same to them. That's Mahjong at its most basic, trying to make a winning hand while discarding your own tiles tactically. Most modern Mahjong games will give you helpful hints like if you can make a meld by stealing a tile, but Yakuman, being from 1989, doesn't. In fact, the game doesn't tell you a lot of things, Assumingly because the game is made for the hardened salary man who knows Mahjong inside and out. All of your playing options are laid out in a small text field that you need to cycle through in order to execute an action. At the start of your turn, you can either form a meld or draw a tile. From there, you can create a meld, discard a tile or declare victory. I guarantee you will mess up your first couple of games. But stick with it and you might end up like me, down a rabbit hole in Mahjong. If you want to learn more, I've put links in the resources I use to learn the game in the description, but combined with these, I do think Yakuman is relatively beginner friendly on easy mode. The obvious fault of all tiles being black and white aside, Yakuman isn't without its flaws. The difficulty can be a little bit off put in to begin with. For example, I felt as soon as I discarded a tile, the game would mock me by producing either the tile I would have needed to win, or that the AI would get an incredibly good hand right off the bat. The one round I played against the Yakuman Master confirmed this bias towards the computer as well, I lost in two turns, leading me to believe that games against the higher level AI is incredibly stacked towards the computer. It's worth mentioning that the game's music, much like the presentation of the game, is very straightforward, but surprisingly it's not too repetitive and actually works to soothe you into playing some Mahjong. If you're up for learning something new, Yakuman can be the gateway to a world of Mahjong. As a launch title, Japanese copies are plentiful and in general pretty cheap to get a hold of. To be honest, that goes for most Mahjong games regardless of system because of their niche appeal, so why not give it a go? I never in a million years expected to enjoy playing Mahjong as much as I have with this game, so chances are more Mahjong will show up on Biographic in the future. If you end up taking the plunge into the wonderful world of tile-based tabletop games like I have, then more power to you. If not, hopefully this quick peek at an often overlooked launch title has opened your eyes to what the Game Boy might have been in a world without Tetris. Either way, the Game Boy went on to win hearts and minds of gamers the world over, and now, 30 years later, 
its legacy is clear to see. From its influence on gaming on the go seen in the Nintendo Switch and mobile games, through to the diverse audience of people the Game Boy made into lifelong gamers. Nintendo's handy gaming machine changed the way we play games forever. So here's to you, old friend. Happy birthday, and here's to 30 more. And that brings us to the end of another biographic, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, let me know if you're going to take the Mahjong plunge down in the comments below. And until next week, game boys and girls, where I'll be back with another gaming classic, remember, as always, to game on.